ask yourself these two questions. What do I want to exist even if I don't? And how much of a difference do I make to it? If you've got good answers to both of those, you have meaning in life. If you have only the first but not the second, you're seeking. If you have neither, you're in trouble. So the title's a little bit misleading because um, I wanted to really work at trying to introduce what the crisis is in case some of you are unfamiliar with my work. And then just at the very end, point to um, how we should try and respond to it. So what is going on there? What is this meaning that we're talking about? Well, it's a metaphor. Okay? It's something like this. There's something like the way a sentence hangs together, is coherent, and connects the world to you with the possibility of truth. Right? Of course, philosophers will argue about all of that, but that's, right, that's the basic part of the metaphor. And then Susan Wolf wrote an excellent book on this, Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. And what she says is, first of all, she makes very clear arguments that meaning in life is not reducible to morality, which is kind of a project that we're trying to try right now as a culture. And given a lot of the psychological research and the philosophical argument, I predict that will fail. You can't get meaning in life by just having a well-organized uh, well moral code that you follow. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean your, your life can be independent of a moral code. We're talking about reducibility. We're not talking about independence, okay? Just please remember that. <laughs> okay, it's also not reducible to in sort of environmental mastery, your ability to get success in the world. We all know the tropes of people who are amazingly successful and you know, their lives are empty and meaningless and the movie of the week, okay? And, and, there's, and there's truth to that. And the one that you might not know, that to, for me is the most scientifically interesting, um, is that me meaning in life is not reducible to subjective well-being. Subjective well-being is that sense of, my life is good, I'm happy with my life, I'm contented with my life, right? And our culture confuses that with wealth, and wealth is only initially predictive of subjective well-being, and then it confuses subjective well-being with meaning in life, and so we're kind of screwed, right? Because I can point to prototypical instances in which meaning in life and subjective well-being come apart. The most powerful one is have a kid. Every important measure of subjective well-being collapses when you're having a kid. Because you're in a shipwreck, you're wet all the time, there's alarm bells going off, you're hungry, you're not sleeping, the person you thought you loved the most hates you, right? You're sick all the time, your finances are reduced. Every time you have a child, you actually reduce your overall longevity. So why would you do it? When you ask people, they do it because it makes their lives more meaningful. Meaning in life, up, subjective well-being down. Okay? Again, I'm not claiming they're completely independent. I'm claiming you can't reduce one to the other. I'm gonna, I've said that twice, so if you missed a tribute, you're just evil. <laughs> okay. So, this also, think about what that is with a the child. They want to be connected to something that has a reality and an existence and a value beyond their own egocentric concerns, if they are good parents. That's an important if, <laughs> but if they are. Now, this is all connected to independent lines of research, with, which shouldn't be independent. Suffer psychology, you may have heard this, is suffering a replication crisis, Mo many of the social sciences is. By the way, cognitive psychology, the part that overlaps with cognitive science, is not going through a replication crisis. Okay, because it has rich theoretical debate and a lot of good experimental competi competition, and it pursues synoptic integration rather than just incentivizing innovation, which is very problematic for psychology. Right? Okay, all that being said, that was a little bit of a rant. <laughs> rant over back here. Okay, right? So she's got a, this whole other body of work around sense of belonging, which I think is just another way of talking about meaning in life. And by the way, if you don't have a sense of belonging, you're in trouble. You're in trouble financially, socioeconomically, cultural, psych psychological. Like, you're just in trouble if you don't have a sense of belonging. Like, you, you're really degrading across multiple dimensions. Um, so I recommend taking a look at, she's got a little tiny thin book, which is good for sort of popular access without being stupid, right? Uh, just called Belonging. And she uh, reviews some of that literature. 
Now, what's, what's happening in belonging is, I would argue, and I, I've been arguing this year, it's, it's cultural amplification of something that is continuous with biology. Um, so we used to think right, that the environment shaped the organism. That's sort of a standard interpretation of Darwinian patterns. We're now coming, I, I would argue, and one of the best philosophers of biology is at the University of Toronto, because everything important is actually happening in Toronto. <laughs> right? um, and and it's, so it's this idea around niche construction. The idea is, yes, the animal's being shaped by the environment, but the, env the animal's also shaping the environment. So you have to actually talk about the entire dynamical system. And then what I want you to consider, I can't give you the argument for it now, so I'm just making a gestural argument, is culture is that on, on methamphetamines. It's speeding this up and accelerating it, right? Because think of what's happening. Culture is massively shaping you to fit this environment and shaping this environment to fit you. Other animals would come in here and go, what the hell is going on? Like, look at how artificial this is. Other than the atmosphere in our naked bodies, everything else is technology and cultural shaping. Okay, so belonging is when there's been a co-shaping of organism and environment so they fit well, so they belong together. Okay, that's belonging. And of course, that carries into a sense of home. Another way of understanding the meaning crisis is, is right, and we argued this in the zombie book, and I've argued it in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, my video series, right, is people are experiencing cultural domicile. People have shelter, but they don't feel at home. They don't, they don't feel at home. And the, one, one, one strategy is nihilism. Well, there's just no home to be found. The other is, I'll retreat as much as I can, and I'll find somewhere inside myself alone the kernel of home. All right. So what are the four dimensions of meaning in life? Just think about these quickly. Uh, uh, purpose, which is our culture tries to identify meaning in life with purpose. Purpose is only one of four dimensions. It's not the most important. Is the idea of an overarching goal. Coherence, that's that nomological structure. Things have to make sense for you. Significance, you have to be connected to something that's really real. And the one that's most important, mattering, connectedness. This is how you determine if you have mattering, which I think is the core of meaning in life. In fact, I think the other three point to the fourth, mattering. Ask yourself these two questions. What do I want to exist even if I don't? And how much of a difference do I make to it? If you've got good answers to both of those, you have meaning in life. If you have only the first but not the second, you're seeking. If you have neither, you're in trouble. So think about that. Purpose, coherence. Purpose is a goal. Coherence is it's well formulated, my, my, my situation, my problem is well structured. Significance and mattering, I'm connected to what's really relevant in this situation. We're talking about really good problem solving structures, really good problem formulation. But not at the level of individual problems, like, like how to give a good talk or how to uh, deal with your hunger. We're talking about problem solving at the meta meaning level at that level of the worldview that I was talking about earlier, about how the culture is modeling to you, giving you a cognitive grammar of how you should be modeled to fit the world and how the world should be modeled to fit you, right? And I think that level is the level at which we need cultural modeling of how we deal with sort of two meta problems. And these go to the sort of, here's the cultural level, and then the meta problems are sort of at the primordiality of our cognition, and we need the two properly connected to each other. So here's the meta level telling us about how the agent and the arena should fit together. And what are the two meta problems? Well, a meta problem is any problem that you need to solve. Whenever you're solving a problem, you have to solve these two meta problems in order to be adaptive, to be a generally intelligent being. The one is I need to anticipate the world. The farther out I can anticipate the world, in fact, you do this intuitively. The more, the more intelli intelligence you will attribute to an entity, the more purely reactive it is, the less intelligent. You've got the intuitive sense, which is largely correct, that the farther out you can anticipate, the better. And I think the predictive processing framework is doing a lot to bring some clarity and uh, hopefully some rigor. It's still being worked out to that notion of anticipation. We pre can predictively prepare for the world. That's what intelligence does for you. 
if you can avoid the tiger, it's way better than fighting the tiger. Okay, the other, and these two are interlocked, is something you may have heard me talk about once or, once in, or twice, relevance realization, which I think is the, one of the fundamental problems. You're facing it right now. There's way too much information to pay attention to. There's way too much information in your long-term memory and all the possible combinations. It's combinatorially explosive. Look, in a simple chess game, just the number of alternative moves you can consider making, patterns of moves, just calculate that. That's, number than the, that's greater than the number of atomic particles in the universe. So what you have to do, it sounds like a Zen Cohen, you're intelligent by ignoring overwhelmingly most of the information. And you zero in on the relevant information. You pay a price for that. I'll come back to that. But that is the power of your adaptivity. That is the thing I've tried to figure out my whole scientific career. It's the thing that we have to actually give AGI. And by the way, the LLMs don't have that for themselves very much. They're relying on us in very many ways to supply that missing relevance realization. That doesn't mean they aren't, they aren't powerful, by the way. And I won't get into that. There's another great talk. I've got a video essay on that if you want. Okay. I won't go into how I think relevance realization works. Um, you're doing it right now, though, by the way. You have, you have two kinds of attention. You have task focus. Is, I got to try and follow this odd person giving these, making noises come out of his face hole, and somehow I'm supposed to turn this into ideas, right? That's task focus. And then you have default mode network. Your mind is wandering. You're thinking about other stuff. And it's like Darwinian evolution. That's variation, and most of that gets killed off, but some of it gets taken into the sensory motor loop. That's like, the evol that's like reproduction. And so you're reproducing your sensory motor uh, contact, and you're constantly evolving variation and selection, variation and selection, what you pay attention to. That's how relevance realization works, and it gives you an optimal grip on the world. That's why we had all those contact metaphors. Optimal grip means there's no, there's no perfect way to pay attention or size things up because it depends on what's the task and what is relevant to you. Right? Even, even when you're looking at an object, do you need to, the details or do you need to pull back and see the whole thing? Do you, above, beside? And by the way, you never see a full object. That's only an imaginal thing. You imagine you see the whole object. You never do. So. Just published a paper, end of 2022, integrating those two together, predictive processing and relevance realization. So read it, because it, it is the one true thing that will save your soul. <laughs> OK, so the point I need for my, this talk is that relevance realization is not cold calculation. It is that you care about this information rather than that information. That is how you are still different from all the computational entities. They don't care about the information they're processing. They don't care if it's true or false. You do, and you can make them act to what you care about, but they don't care for themselves. Okay? And it is commitment. It's caring and it's commitment. You are committing your precious attention, which is limited, your metabolic resources, which are limited, and your time, which by the way, you should remember, is limited. So it's caring. It's committed connectedness. So I use this word religio, R-E-L-I-G-I-O, which is probably the etymological origin of religion, because I want to convey, because it means connectedness, but it means connectedness in this deep way of care, commitment, connectedness. And here's the proposal, that when we're talking about meaning in life and belonging, we're actually talking about religio. That's what it's a metaphor for. So we've got the top level, the agent arena relationship, and then we have the bottom-up religio. And when, we, when it's working, they are in consonant with each other, and people aren't suffering a meaning crisis. When it's not working, they suffer a meaning crisis. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.